Um, yeah, you know, I, I think I wanted just because of these recent days and you know this uh, experience. I think I just wanted to tell a little story about something just real quick at the beginning. Uh, so, you know, I was the kernel development lead for Windows 95. And uh, the day, August 24th, we were RTMing, you know, released to manufacturing. Um, I was actually out going from building to building, investigating bug reports of different people around the company to see if those were things that would literally put the brakes on the entire you know, pipeline of manufacturers and, and just everything all the way to Christmas because August 24th was supposed to be our last possible day. And uh, we didn't hold the release, but you know, the last thing that we just did for this uh, three hour delay, it's actually gonna be a little more only, not not because of the, like what we're gonna do on the call, but because the uh, builds are gonna be published, I think, as we're talking. So the last thing we did was a relatively obscure testnet only um, crash that would happen when Asher was running, Asher does a lot of scripts and different things to set up identities and and uh, currencies on the test net. And in the process of doing all of that, he hit something. And you know, I'd rather that we're able to run this than even do this a little bit early. Um, I'd rather that we're able to just have people run this, send between chains, Convert currencies, make currencies, make chains, and really get to try it out um, without having to focus on things like that. So I think it was, you know, what we needed to do. And thanks everyone for, uh, for being here. Wow. What we're going to do is we've got the test net up. Um, it's, we've, we've got the releases. Uh, I think the CLI releases are signed. Um, the GUI releases are probably not yet signed. Um, we'll be running on the released code. And I will start, I'll define and launch PBAS chain. Don't believe there's anything that would hold them back from being published. And then anyone who wanted to join worldwide in everything we're doing, would actually be able to, because this is not something that runs on some centralized system. This is actually, you know, launching of a fully decentralized blockchain launch along with decentralized finance capabilities for converters and everything else. And IDs get moved over and IDs can be issued on that chain. I will go ahead and, and be able to uh, start it up and mine it. And then Michael Toot Jr., so I'm in the U.S., and Michael Toot Jr. is in Europe. And then he's going to share his screen with the GUI and show you how when somebody defines a launch, which causes a number of very cool things to happen on the chain, including the rewards significantly go up because of the fees for defining a launch and, and launching a chain. Someone defines a launch for a chain, then uh, everyone around the world who's connected to the network can see that that launch is coming and when the start block is, so when they should start at their nodes. Um, there is one thing that uh, we noticed that we didn't address, which is you're going to need to wait for a chain launch. Well, you should. You don't really need to, but you should wait for a chain launch until the actual start block to start up the nodes for the other um, new blockchain or you're loaded into your wallet. But when you do, you just have to know on the GUI, you just select the chain that you want. 
And on the command line, you just have to know the name. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I'm running on the Veris test network. I've got uh, eight connections. And there are um, 380 blocks there. I have a PBAS command that I'm going to I'm going to put it into my window. Can people actually see that command? Yeah, it's I know it looks like a lot of text. Yep. But I'm going to pull a few things I out can. of it just to tell you what it means. Great. All right. So the name of this uh, new blockchain that I'm about to launch is called Quantum Gravity. And we just thought that was a nice name for a little chain that we could have in the testnet community. And Michael Toot Jr. and Mike, this is not a, we have a little bit of a pre-mine or pre-allocation going on. Um, and Michael Toot Jr. and Mike have a pre-allocation of a million. Um, the conversion, so I'm defining actually two currencies here and one blockchain, this command. And there are a lot of verbose notary names because these are actual notaries that we're going to make. Like these are people around the testnet community, but really they're nodes and they're people that we're going to allow people to use on their chains. If you know, not a, you can make your own notaries, but if, it makes sense for that chain to fit on the um, you know notaries that are that are helping make chains work for the tests in the community. That would be reasonable. Um, the idea behind this name, Quantum Gravity, is that, and I think uh, Chris Monkins is yep on the call. Um, is that he actually some time ago put in the Falcon 512 uh, post quantum or quantum resistant signature algorithms. And in order to just plug those in um, to the smart transactions, you know, we just need to do a little bit of work and it hasn't been our priority. But in launching this blockchain, you know, we could or Chris could, or someone could actually work on a version of Varus on this quantum gravity chain. I'm not saying we're gonna do this now. I'm not saying we're gonna release the uh, quantum resistant um, signatures that you could just redefine as your, you know, the queue addresses that you could put in your ID and then all of your funds would be now secured by a quantum resistant algorithm. I'm not saying that we're gonna put that in by this next release, but creating a new blockchain that's connected to the other chain gives you the ability to do lots of different things that you might not wanna do on the shared chain with everyone across testnet. Um, and it also kind of lets you use your own nodes to try that stuff out if you want. So anyhow, we're, we're starting the quantum gravity chain. We got some reallocations for the, the currency that is the native currency. So the first currency that we're launching is called uh, quantum gravity. And actually, um, I think I want to take out the spaces because that's just a little too verbose for what I was hoping. Uh, Oh, actually, I think I've got the ID there. I think I won't. I don't get to do that. So uh, unless I redefine a new quantum no space gravity ID. So um, what we're doing here is quantum gravity is the first currency. And then there's another currency that's also being defined at the same time. Down below, about three lines from the bottom, 
in the definition of quantum gravity, after I have defined the nodes that are going to be starting, which are not the nodes of the whole network, they're just start nodes. Um, the notary identities that I'm going to be using. Um, after I've defined all of those things, uh, then I can specify a gateway converter name. And that actually does more than just make a name. What that does is allows me to specify a currency that by default is liquidity pool, a 100% backed fractional currency of both the native chain of the chain that's launching this PBAS chain and the native currency of the PBAS chain. That's the default. You can set all of the same parameters that you can normally set, including pre-allocations, including carve-outs, pre-launch carve-outs that, that actually redirect um, portions of the proceeds of the uh, initial conversions um, to do different, you know, all sorts of uh, different currencies in the basket that you might add. So you can do all of those things. Um, and you don't have to. What you, what you need to do, if you're going to specify a converter currency, then you should issue a little bit of the native currency into it. Another kind of a launch model for that. Um, that's really interesting, but there's just so much, it's, it's hard to cover everything. And so you can actually issue currency of the native currency directly into the liquidity pool, which in fact um, doubles the value, the inherent value of the, the market cap of the liquidity pool and is a way that if somebody um, participates in the liquidity pool launch and not the native currency launch, they're holding the basket currency. The price actually is calculated not including the gateway converter issuance. And so what happens is um, normally with a launch, if it was like that, you would want to have some kind of pre-allocation or um, something to actually make it so that all of a sudden people wouldn't just be able to convert back um, at a larger amount uh, than they started with. And because, you know, all of these tools let you control so much in terms of the economics of what is starting on the blockchain. And that's a lot of power, but everything's transparent. You don't have to write a program that someone has to audit to understand because all of this information is right on the blockchain. The blockchain is currency aware. Everything is integrated in with the with the consensus mechanism. But you have a lot of power when you're starting a currency. You're effectively, uh, when you define the currency, you can define it to be completely decentralized, or you can define it to be uh, very centralized, even to the point where it allows you to mint currencies. So what happens here is that um, this quantum this bridge dot quantum gravity, which is how it will be known once it's made, because it is actually going to be an ID and a currency that is on the new chain when it launches. This bridge dot quantum gravity is going to have not just Varus test and quantum gravity currencies in it. It's also going to have USD in it. Token that's on the Veris test chain right now. And there will be a set of contributions. Now, if you notice, um, I, I haven't defined any contribution of the quantum gravity currency because actually it doesn't exist yet. So when I enter this, and actually this is probably going to um, take a lot of space when I enter it, uh, then assuming that we got all this command right. The point that here, though, is that 
the notaries are defined as a list of identities. And the minimum notaries to confirm is five on this chain. But you can remember the identities are multi-sig and you can actually choose any number that fits in a definition, which I don't know the maximum yet, and any number of notaries to confirm for your chain, or you might ask to use the community notaries for a test that you're trying to run or something you're trying to run. And as long as you have a majority sure. or the number of notaries you specify as minimum, uh, running merge mining basically it's actually you you need to merge mine by running the two um demons on the same machine or knowing how to connect them with their comp files it's really not harder than that and you'll see in a minute um or you when you're merge mining if right now this is on testnet we're going to make the commands a little bit easier when you're merge mining um, all the hash is generated by the Varus test chain. And if you're not mining on Varus test and you're merge mining on one of the PBAS chains that you're notarizing, then you are notarizing. I'm getting hungry again. Then we, uh, could, whoever that is, could we mute, please? I'm hungry too. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, ah, that looks much better, but I forgot that I had some breakpoints set and I'm running in the debugger. So there it is. I just went through them. So that is, so the reason that we spit out this big piece of uh, hex is so that you don't make a mistake and because we could easily, this is actually just the transaction that needs to be run. And so to define the currency now, all I need to do is send that transaction. So I just do send raw trans. This is all in the command line. Transaction with that. And there. Now we have a new blockchain that is visible to others on the network that is now ready for launch and moving towards launch that can be joined by anyone worldwide as long as they have access to the nodes. So you can actually do private networks this way. Um, and can also communicate back and forth automatically with the Varus test chain and it has the ability to issue IDs. It has the ability to, uh, let's, let me go ahead. And, um, it has the ability to uh, create an unlimited number of tokens and fractional currencies and liquidity pools. And it has basically all of the capabilities. We're not yet fractal which will be a release after this upcoming release. Um, and uh, it's a full-fledged blockchain system as capable as the one that launched it, basically. But it's also, as you'll see in a moment, I'm going to take a look at the currency, make sure we got it. Everything fine, which I'm pretty confident everything's fine. Quantum gravity. And there it is. And I can actually buy some of it now from the blockchain because it's set up to do that. Um, I It actually looks like it has the, it's set to have the same price for conversions to the native currency, which I can participate in. You can provide prevent people from participating in the native currency. Um, the way you do it is with a pre-convert command. Um, you can also participate in the launch 
of the bridge currency, which we see the definition of here on the blockchain, you can participate in its launch. Um, and when you do, you're basically creating a liquidity pool with all other participants that gets priced launch. Conversions are all figured out. Same price for every pre-launch participant that all gets priced at launch. And when you're defining a currency, just like any other fractional currency, you have a few options. You can set a pre-launch discount which will price the currency for everyone who is you know, converting beforehand with that discount. You'll, it will price the currency based on all of the participants. And in a currency like Bridge, the interesting thing is that, remember, the native currency is being issued at launch. It doesn't exist yet. And so the price, for example, of this currency for me to convert, whatever the price is, is calculated based on only the Varus test and USD that people use to convert into this currency. And at launch, that is matched with the value that in the in the liquidity pool issued from the blockchain. Remember, you can have a pre-launch discount. So what that means, if you do a pre-launch discount, it means that the people who are participating in the pre-convert will get a discount on the final price. How, how does that possibly work? Well, I'll explain. Two things about that. Um, they'll get a discount on the final price. Uh, that actually you might choose to limit the participation of so that, you know, if everybody gets a discount on the final price, then all you really have is something that when it launches is almost certainly going to go down. But if you have a lot of demand for a particular project or a launch, and you set a maximum on the level of participation pre-launch, then Everyone in the network can participate until you hit the maximum, and then everyone who tries just gets refunded. Now, you can also set a minimum, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But so basically, now I've got this, um, this bridge currency, this bridge dot uh, quantum gateway currency, and, uh, and that currency. I can also get a pre-allocation of. And the pre-allocation is price neutral. So this, this bridge currency has a price and every reserve in it has a price. And that price is the conversion price on chain. And it's based on the liquidity pool. But the backing of the liquidity pool doesn't have to be 100%. And if it's not 100%, if you're familiar with the Bancor formulas or fractional reserve, it follows the same kind of mathematical curve as if the empty space in the currency was another currency, basically. But what that means, the effect that that has on the currency is that if people convert to it, it goes up. And if people convert away from it, it goes down. It's always liquid and it's based on the market. And so it isn't necessarily bad to have a fractional currency um, and everything is transparent and everyone can know exactly what the fractions are of everything at launch and all through its lifetime. And when you issue a, pre, a price neutral pre-allocation, that expands, that reduces the reserve ratio from 100%. When you have a pre-launch discount, that reduces the reserve ratio a little bit based on the pre-launch discount. And when you do a pre-launch carve-out, that also reduces the reserve ratio. And these are all ways that when you create a launch, you have tools 
to help fund things, to help redirect pub, you know, community, fully decentralized funds, support different causes, all sorts of different things you can do with this. And then finally, IDs, remember, can be locked. And IDs can receive pre-allocations. And IDs can be set to receive pre-allocations and to not have a way to unlock them. So you can actually set a launch up so that there are all sorts of positive incentives, pretty much, you know, most of the incentives I'm aware of in any kind of a, you know, augmented bonding curve launch or all sorts of, of you know, very um, fair and, uh, and effective launches for funding and things like that. Now, let's just, one last thing I want to mention is the um, a minimum contribution. So minimum contribution you can set. Uh, it's not showing up because it wasn't set. And that is an amount that people must contribute up to in total across everyone worldwide on the blockchain when you do a launch. And if they don't, everyone automatically gets their pre-conversions refunded on the blockchain without you having to do anything. Except the fees for launching currencies and launching blockchains are not refundable. They go to the miners and the stakers of the old chain, or the old the the launch chain. So fifty percent of the fees. So basically, we've launched. We've we've gotten to the state where we're ready to launch, and so um, it looks to me like everything looks good. I think we've got the pre-allocation set up. It looks like everything looks looks good. So um, what I'm going to do is at this point. I'm going to ask Michael Toot Jr. if he has, let's see, is he on here? Yeah, I'm here. You there? Mm -hmm. And are you able to load up and share your screen maybe? Yeah, I see quantum gravity, but I haven't added it yet because I wanted to show on the screen. All right, so Michael is in a, another, on another continent. And he's just connected to the Veris Test network. And then he's right now going to share his screen. Um, he's our lead developer, community lead developer for the GUI. He's going to share his screen and, uh, and show us how it works to connect to the chain and start mining it and actually send currencies and convert currencies and send them off chain. And you see? Uh, this is the wallet screen. I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with it if you've used this wallet. And then basically, uh, you can either access the add PBAS chain from here or from the add coin menu as well. So anything that uh, has been started on the network as a PBAS chain will just show up here. So just click on it and add it as if it was any other coin. And we'll just start up. Okay, so pretty positive we know what's going on. Um, we hadn't started PBAS chains with spaces in them before. And I didn't realize we were going to start one now. And so there, we found an issue that we actually would not have held the re We won't hold the release. But... Uh, until there's a new release that processes this on that API call correctly. Don't have a space in your uh, currency launch name, especially if you're going to do a marketing call with the whole community. So that's what that's it's for, so. <laughs> it's what I thank you. It's what I call book hunting. No, I mean, you know, we wanted to show you the technology, not 
the different and we actually so it was going to be called demo chain and it didn't have a space in it and then i had the great idea because you know before the uh call like we actually do have a quantum resistant algorithm on DAC, and the way that ids work you know you will be able to the q address as the controlling address for an id when that's um on on the main net and that will make all of the uh utxos that are sent to that id quantum resistant they will be protected by quantum resistant signatures um and so the i had this idea that you know we could make a quantum chain but there's a quantum currency so we looked up quantum gravity as all one word and it wasn't anything and I think that right before this, the name changed from demo chain to quantum gravity. And it was communicated in voice. And so then we found this issue for everyone, with everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, <laughs> for helping us test. And let me see if... Uh, So I think there are two things to do now, um, because before I actually look into it more deeply, I will not um, know for sure. Uh, we certainly could address whatever this is, but I need to know for sure. And I don't need to do it immediately since we have everybody here and we're, and thank you for taking all of your time. Um, you know, we're just going to have to accept that that's where it is right now. And rather than going off and uh, trying to salvage the thing that we wanted to show you, which was that Michael could use the GUI to send uh, within minutes of the launch that uh, stop short of happening that he would be able to send cross chain and uh, convert along the way. All right, let's go back to questions. Sorry, Oink, I interrupted you. Ah, that's no problem. That's no problem. Uh, is there in the current API, uh, uh, current uh, daemon, an API to uh, concisely uh see the prices uh for example an api that can be fed into uh coin gecko coin paprika etc yeah um let me show you some of the things that we can do see i think that's the right window okay so you see that screen Uh, still loading for me, but that's not uncommon. It just popped up. See it. It popped up. All right. Yep. So, uh, so let's see what currencies we have. Or actually, let's do this. So we'll do get currency converters. Um, and I'm going to say Varus test and USD. And what this will do is it will list all of the currencies that have a thousand Varus worth of liquidity or more, and that can convert between Varus test and USD. So it's a pretty big list on testnet right now, looks like Asher's been setting up currencies. Um, and so I'm scrolling through the different currencies that I'm going to go to the top so we can just kind of see from, yeah, there we go. So, okay, so here's a currency that's a basket of Varus, Bitcoin, ETH, USD, Euro, and gold, all test coins, of course. And uh, it's evenly divided between them all. 
and there were some initial contributions. And we can look at the price of this currency. This is a currency right here. Okay. It's a basket of those other currencies. Now, all of this, that's been working for a long time and it all still works on testnet. And it's the chain launch that looks like there's some question about being able to process the information it's getting from the other chain right now. But um, so down below, there is for every on-chain currency, these numbers change if it's a converter type or a basket currency. These numbers, oh, and one more thing about this API, get converter currencies. If you have a project that has fungible currencies as a basket because you don't want to worry about having to worry about a Binance or Coinbase exchange listing and you just want to have your currency convertible between a number of different currencies. If you have a project like that and it's got an adequate set of reserves, meaning it was like 10% per currency minimum uh, and also a thousand Varus in reserves. Then it'll show up when people look for get currency reserves because they might want to be arbitraging through um, currencies. So you can actually do this query, get currency converters, sorry. Um, and you can specify the currencies that you want to convert between. And it will return all the currencies that can do that that have that kind of liquidity. So the price in reserve here of each of these currencies is how much the um, fractional currency is in each of these reserves. And using this price, you can actually convert across all of these with a very, very little bit of math. And that's the price, that's the instantaneous price. But of course, when a bunch of people send in one direction or another direction, uh, you know, and you got people converting in all directions, then everybody gets, it's actually not, this is the instantaneous price that you're seeing here, all right? But there are a few other things. So down below, this is something that is in a uh, notarization for a fractional currency. The currency state is there. And this gives you all of the um, conversions that have happened, the currencies that have come in, the currencies that were converted out, if the weight changed because of an emission of currency um, or minting of a, a centralized currency, or burning of a currency, um, you know, prices can change. And all of these numbers change every time that there is an aggregated uh, processing of conversions and, and all sorts of things that can happen on one of these currencies. And the last, so you see something here called last conversion price, okay? And, and what that is actually, that really is the last conversion price that someone converting from any, from this currency that is in question, got converting into the main currency, right? There is, it's a two-step process of all, of processing all conversions because some conversions go in, some conversions go through. And the conversions that go in, go in, and the conversions that go through, go in and come out. Everybody gets the same price on the in, and everybody gets the same price on the out, okay? So the via conversion price is what you get on via, and the last conversion price is what you get on in. You can see that they may be a little bit different because what happens is these go in and out. And so if you take a look at one of these as an example, price in reserve, let's look at, so I know that this, I recognize this, this is Varus test, right? So the price in reserve, the instantaneous price in reserve, yeah, this is an arbitrage 
a bot's dream, but the not really, because the fact is you don't get to control. It is and it isn't. It's a different arbitrage because this address is front running in a way that means, you know, arbitraging to, to be really good at arbitrage. You either want to have um, AI or you want to be a miner or a staker on the protocol because there's a little slot for you to insert fairly arbitrage um, or you want a combination of those things and you could do really well, really well because all the information is there. And, uh, and so basically you've got this instantaneous price in reserve right here for Varus test. And that's uh, 35953240. And if you go down here, you see the last conversion price was 35971223. That was the price of the conversions that people bought in with Varus test to this, the pre-conversions, everybody got that price. And if you, and I'm gonna explain why these prices are the way they are in a second. If you look at, uh, this is Bitcoin, right? So the last conversion price for Bitcoin was 1694 sats for this currency. Okay, so let's go up to Bitcoin here. Uh, it was 1694 and the instantaneous price is 1693. Uh, yeah, 1693, which was also the conversion price. And so what's happening here, just so you know, is that when there is a block of transactions being processed, they can go in any direction through this currency. You can go, you can buy in, you know, convert into the a fractional currency itself and hold the basket and make fees because all conversion, all fees, conversion fees. Wait, someone, wait, someone muted it. Um, all convert all conversion fees are accepted in any of the different currencies and converted automatically as part of the processing through this same process, along with everything else, in and out, are converted automatically to the Satoshi, to the native currency of the chain. And when a miner looks at this transaction, not this one, because this is just information about it. When a miner looks at um, an import transaction that processes all of these transactions, they just get to see the native fees coming out. They don't even care about well, they do because they validate everything that's happening in it. But when it comes to calculating the fee and making a block, it's a native fee that comes out because all converters on each chain include the native currency. So the way that the bridges work, it's a currency that includes both native currencies of each side. And when you send from one side to the other, whether it's ETH to Varus or Varus to ETH or whatever it is, the bridge currency can be on the receiving system or on the sending system. And it works just as well. And the bridge currency can do a few things. It can convert between any of the currencies in it. And it can also convert the fees that are from the originating chain or system into the native currency to be paid out as fees in the receiving system. So each system can just operate more simply, focusing more on its own native currencies. Now, you know, there's, I talked about it before, there's this chicken and the egg problem. And, and the challenge is that when you're starting a currency, when you start, that's why we do, converter issuance, you know, you're issuing currencies from the new native blockchain into the converter. And, you know, the way that you set up all these numbers, it's it's all transparent. Everything's transparent. 
Everyone can see what these numbers are. They know what they mean. It's not hidden behind code in a contract because it always works the same. And, and so, um, so when you actually set up a currency and, and you're creating a blockchain, you don't, you might want to do a voting chain, for example. You know, it was in our vision paper and it's a very important part of things. And for a voting chain, you might want to have the voters protect the chain, right? So you might want to actually, and, and you also might want to have the confidential, verifiable and transparent polls and elections that we talked about. So you might want to use ZK SNARK privacy for the voting process. And so you might want to actually limit the native currency to the voters and just make it so that they're the ones who get the native currency. And you might not want to allow people to convert back and forth between a currency and another currency so that your native currency may not be a really a fungible currency. And so when you launch a PBAS chain, PBAS chains can also accept Verus test, in this case, in Verus, um, as fees. And, you know, a project could, if they decided to make that route that eventually through, you know, a, a converter or something if they wanted to. But, but by doing that, it makes it easy. And it's actually, it's just the launching chain. So it's when it's fractal, basically the new chain will be able to accept the launching chain's currency as fees, even if it doesn't have a converter. But the converters actually solve something that I kind of think most, like most of the cross-chain, you know, multi-chain projects and everything, they haven't even started to actually think about, which is how are you going to, you know, fees and native currencies are actually how we secure decentralized blockchains. So if you're not going to eventually migrate towards the centralized model that everyone says you have to start with, which you really don't, it's just harder. Um, you know, you actually want to have a model where people could start up a chain and not necessarily um, have all of the pieces and not have the converters and everything else but you need to be able to handle fees in systems that are secured that way. So whether it's, you know, you might not be able, you might not want to have that capability on a voting chain, but between ETH and Varus, there's no person who's going to be paying money or, you know, like focusing on manually making that bridge work besides just notaries running nodes saying, that's the chain I see. That's pretty much it. And everything else is cryptographic proofs. So by being able to actually handle the fees across systems, you know, we instantaneously automate things that um, I don't want to name names, but I looked in, you know, one of the top multi-chain projects documentation and, you know, they were saying how great it's going to be when one day people could automate like fully automate these things. And, uh, you know, we start with this, with notaries, this notary model as just a validation step. But um, as I said before, you know, the next generation that will also be fractal has no, we do not have to require notaries, but notaries have a lot of benefits in a lot of cases. So anyway, back to questions. Sorry, that was a lot. Probably too long. I'll try to keep it shorter. Um, yeah, it does answer my question, but it uh, also makes me clear to me that uh, between a, uh, a price aggregator like uh, Coin Paprika, Coin Gecko, Coin Market Cup, uh, there needs to be a uh, probably a website with an API for them because they're not going to do this. So we'll need to but you know it for doesn't it. here's here's the thing we need to stop thinking that like it would be a nice thing to do but it isn't something we have to do like they will have to do that i believe the reason is this if the prices aren't right on our network 
that's great because it'll be the secret that everybody who's making money on the network actually wants to keep. But you know what? They won't be able to. They won't be able to keep that secret. We don't need to try and make our prices accurate because to make our prices accurate is to earn money. And when you do that, you make more conversions happen. You create more liquidity. And one way or the other, wherever the prices are, someone gets a better deal in one direction or the other because there is no spread. So yeah, I'm, not I, saying, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But, but I'm saying that we really don't necessarily have to feel like we will have a network, a worldwide network used by a lot of people that will have prices on it. And if those prices are wrong and, they're, and they don't match coin market cap, then either coin market cap is wrong or if those prices are really wrong, then you'll be able to go and make money changing them. And I would actually submit then that because of that, we'll have more accurate prices for all the currencies than coin market cap. Now I, I I agree with that. No, no matter about that, uh, um, I was thinking uh, marketing uh, that we can share. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I just, my point. Yeah. My point is that we've got a lot of yeah. different things to do, yeah. and I, yeah. you know, if it's easy for somebody to do in the community and make, but I, but I'm kind of. I know that there's been a lot of. Um, a lot of desire to get all these kind of what every other project does because that's what every project should do you know but if we were going to do what every other project should do we wouldn't have a system that's you know verging on on where it is and being able to be you know an unlimited scale block interoperable blockchain network that the entire world could use and evolve to be all sorts of independent systems that all interoperate connect and change the meaning of what it means you know what currency means i mean um i'm just saying that we should it's a nice thing to think about i just don't want people to think that yeah that's all no oh, i wasn't referring to uh the core developers or or the current developers uh, uh having to take on that test so then please uh, thank an, you and yes, it was an every, every it was, as it long was as an yes thank you more right. than that. okay <laughs> All right. Any questions? Hey, it's Business here. Uh, I got a question earlier when you first launched that uh, PBAS chain with the spaces. There's a big raw conversion or a raw transaction, and you said it's now visible. Is there like a command where uh, prospectful miners can? Query a list of available chains to merge by. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just uh, go to the command that I'm still sharing and just show you. You just say um, so. List currencies is a command that shows you all the currencies on this system. But uh, uh, the GUI shows it. But if you're in the in the command line, you know Michael actually showed that any currency that's launching, you can select to connect to and start mining. Um, but if you say list currencies, you can also do some kind of a uh, little advanced queries. So let me just remember this. Um, so list currencies, system type PBAS. And now we see all the PBAS chains that are registered. There's quantum gravity. Looks like there's another one. I'm guessing it's quantum gravity without the spaces. There it is. There's quantum gravity without the spaces. I'm going to copy this converter ID because I want to take a look at it. 
Uh, and there's Varus test. Those are Varus. Varus is basically going to consider itself a PBAS chain. Um, let's see. So you can do that. You can say, uh, launch state and you can say like refunding or launched and i had a break point sorry i do that too often uh okay so um so this says that quantum gravity the one that we did is in a state now that it can launch. And in fact, it actually is if the other, uh, if the node would properly read whatever it is unable to properly read. So that's a chain you could, you know, if launch state was launched, that's a chain you could go and mine on and, and use. that answer the question business yes very much there's actually really a lot to it like a lot to it um so i'm i'm happy to answer any kind of questions of what people might think about i know different people had asked how you would do different things before so you know, and I don't, we don't need to make everyone uh, stay on the call, but I'm happy to continue to answer questions for a bit if people have them. Well, I've got another one. Uh, probably that uh, question will pop up uh, with people. Um, is there a time difference in uh, uh, converting coins uh, to tokens on uh, the main network and the coin of a P uh, of a P box chain? Does it take longer? Is it uh, just as uh, as long? Yeah, yeah, that's a really that's a really good question, and it's actually put into the GUI um, because it it does. So in order, so all right, to understand how it works helps to kind of know how long things take because when you post a cross chain send or a conversion or a pre conversion for participation or any of these kinds of what are called reserve transfer transactions, right? It's a kind of a smart transaction. When you post one of those, um, you specify a number of things. You specify if it is a conversion, what it's converting to. Um, you specify if it's a, cross-chain send, where it's going, and, and, and a lot of different things, all right? And there are, um, there are, uh, and Bishop saying that he'd like, or uh, he or she would like to see a fresh launch live, um, and uh, we could do it later at the end if that works, so. Um, and people could drop off. They didn't want to see it, but I'm guessing that no one's going to drop off to see a live launch. So, um, uh, I lost my train of thought on the question. Um, so, oh, uh, if you're, so if you're aggregating those, so this is the way it works. You get all these reserve transfers and the miners mine them in, right? Now, the miner who mines in the reserve transfers in a block, uh, you know, they could put transactions or they can do different things. But the point is that there's no, that all blocks are processed with their different reserve transfers in any single currency together, always. And so when the miners put in, um, you know, the reserve transfers, they don't really have 
they have an opportunity to uh, arbitrage to kind of an equal state, but they have no incentive for um, throwing things out of whack. And if they, because there's no front and there's no back. And then, so they, let's, now let's pretend that there's no other thing that they could even do between blocks at all. But generally speaking, the whole idea of a blockchain is that you don't have collaboration between miners, you know, and stakers. Um, but so the miner puts the reserve transactions into a block and then the, um, the my next miner creates an export and that export is either just like a, a roll up or it's um, a roll up pr plus all the proof needed, all the data needed to guarantee, you know, cross chain once only in order delivery of that transfer to the other chain. And so, um, so the way that that works, the miner creates the export and then uh, one last miner creates the import of that export. And the miner who creates the import in the protocol after, like it, this is the actual protocol, this isn't required. We would like to get this in because it's a good thing. Um, and we think that we will by mainnet. And that is um, that the import miner gets to add another transaction. The reason is because if anyone tries to pull any funny stuff along the way, they're going to leave an opportunity to be foiled by a miner who gets that final step, who actually has the most interest to arbitrage to equality. So by being a miner or staker and running these import transactions, either we'll get it in or someone will be able to, you know, have um, wallets and nodes and, and demons that um, arbitrage accurately without harming the market and helping to actually prevent by their ability to do it all of the front running before. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, deterrence of unfair minor extracted value, uh, front running, all of these things. And yet at the same time, because of the fee pool and the connection between the decentralized finance and the conversion and the fees and the blockchain system that no other system that I know of has, Miners can do fantastically on this system. Like, like I said, right now, let's see where they are, the block rewards on, actually, I don't know if I'm mining Varus test. Hey, I am. The block rewards on Varus test right now, remember a 12 reward chain is, they're 72. That's based on the prices that we expect to be on mainnet but obviously we have more activity. Well, we don't know. We may not have more activity and it's certain the chain certainly can handle more activity than this. And so when you think about it, when you've got all of these functions and things that are happening, um, nice. The local testnet Explorer is running for those who didn't see that. I just posted that. Um, so for, um, Actually, again, I think I must be tired uh, because once I got excited about the local test net, um, ah, the, the fee pool and the mining economy. So the point is that at some point, and Satoshi said this, at some point you won't need block rewards. Well, I don't even know of another system that is that is creating a model where that's true, actually. 
There probably are, you know, there probably are. So anyways, I'll try to go quicker on answers. Thank you, Agargacher. Um, yeah, we should probably do the live launch of the PBAS chain before we publish the whole thing and just make this marketing call for everybody who joined and then the Q&A maybe and then add the other thing. Thank you very much. You know, the, the issues blocking it right now, look, this is, it's like the story I opened up with. This is an open community project. Companies never show you the sausage making. Companies never show you what goes on behind the scenes. And if you look at a recent, you know, very centralized, um, large internet computer announced that happened yesterday, you know, it's this giant, Yes, let's make that sausage. Highly scripted cover over the machine that makes the sausage. So we are making it together. I mean, I as much as I'm sitting here answering answering questions and talking about the protocol, you know, I I have to say, like Asher really and and Lau and Quipicorn and Michael Toot Jr. You know, those are the people who recently, just recently, have been just so much going above and beyond. Thank you, Foom. But I mean, this stuff really does work. And what we're seeing right now are these like, you know, it's not that things are held together and and that there's a big sheen on it. We didn't we didn't do stuff, you know, to cover it with a veneer. You're really seeing the real thing, and you can see that just evidenced by the fact that I literally didn't uh, adequately uh, check the command I was going to enter on the real testnet chain that you can all connect to that we're running together worldwide. So, um, you know, I would have loved it to go perfectly, and I know that it will in a, you know, maybe in a day I, I know that it will because the things that are going wrong uh, uh yeah i'll answer that business question in a minute the things that are going wrong are actually right now not related to the protocol not well that's not true sorry that's not true this one is related to some implementation issue of that but aside from that Things are not. Things are really looking good. And that's all I can say as someone who's made a lot of sausage. Um, so a chain can have a pre-allocation. That's a, that's a pre-mine, basically. Um, but it's a little bit more... Good night, Agargacher. It's a little bit more than just a pre-mine because you can actually have a list of um, identities that will be automatically exported and imported to the new chain that um, each can have a different amount of a pre-mine or pre-allocation or whatever you want to call it. And those IDs can be also time restricted because they can be time locked. I'm going to leave it at that because that was a pretty short answer for me. In the meantime, I also, um, I've been running testnet this whole time, and I stopped mining recently, but for a while I was mining blocks, and so I can post a screenshot in the marketing channel, basically showing the block rewards of, because the chain got launched and IDs have been registered, and so, you know, there's like two chains, two PBAS chains registered, and a few IDs, and some currencies, and Every block is like 60 various tests, over 100 various tests, 60 various tests, 60 various tests, and um, the reward is 12. That's pretty cool. <coughs> Bishop, um, yes, the, okay, the question, I'll, I'll repeat it because I've been asked to do that. We're seeing the PBAS chains available to merge mine Will we see the net hash of them prior to choosing which ones we want 
to run to assess profitability? You know, it's really an interesting question because uh, that is not something that is just uh, printed out in any um, obvious API call, but I'm going to show you something here. Um, so let's see. Um, it launch info for um, we'll do I I'll get launch in, info for quantum gravity because it's there. Now in this launch info, you see a proof root here. These proof roots are what are used to prove, cryptographically prove. They we have the proof roots for um, Ethereum. We have proof roots for Verus. We can have proof roots for, you know, Komodo or any other. Uh, Currency, I mean, any other blockchain basically typically will have a model for a proof root. Now, we're proof of power on the consensus mechanism, so we're not just proof of work. And what you can see right here, so the notarizations, if you're running right now with the settings, and this is a setting dependent. Um, the notarizations happen about every, miners put them in about every 10 blocks and they have no incentive to put them in outside of what the settings say because they can earn by putting them in with the settings. Otherwise they're just wasting space and they won't get approved anyways. So they won't get confirmed, I mean. And, and once they're confirmed, that's considered like approved or final. So the miners put in notarizations like every 10 blocks, and they end up getting notarized if you have active notaries worldwide. The other chain, uh, with a delay of about, like right now, I think on testnet, we're seeing around, you know, 25 average, maybe 25 minutes, 25 blocks. And so you can see 25 blocks ago if you don't look at an explorer, because the blockchain really doesn't have any model for real time, you know, provable decentralized um, cross network. Like it could actually, well, now that I think about it, I just thought of one other thing you could do. Um, so there is a confirmed, yeah, no, you're just gonna see the confirmed notarization. Um, yeah, you're just gonna see the confirmed notarization for now. And that's probably, I don't see any reason or or I don't believe that that will be changed at all by mainnet because there there's no reason that I know of for this protocol to change except we might like trim things down a little bit in a couple places to allow them to have kind of another nested Oracle mountain range that's it um and we might not do that we don't have to um so we might just release this and then everything's versioned and then have another version that that does that. Um, so what you can do is this power here is actually a reflection of the, uh, you can get a block header basically, and you can see the current difficulty and the, which is what this stuff's calculated on. You can see the current difficulty both for staking and for mining on a block header, but there isn't an API just to do it automatically and someone would have to figure it out. So you would have a delayed, you know, view of the net hash of the other chains. You could get a view, it would be delayed. You could average over, you know, blocks between notarizations. Um, but it's going to be a little bit delayed. Maybe not in a way that matters to you. Good night, Chris. Thanks.
And just one more thing I want to mention because uh, we've talked about it and, and you know, I know this is new to a lot of people. Um, and Michael Toot Jr. shared that mining screen with those giant rewards. Um, you know, it isn't that the blockchain is emitting that much Varus test or Varus. The blockchain is only emitting 12. That's the fee pool. And, all, and so that's not inflation. That's economic activity. Just a comment. Um, excuse me, but... So when I have a couple questions. So what what is the fee pool and how are fees on the mining network changing? So the way it works is there's a 10,000 Varus test fee for launching a PBAS chain. Because it's not, and there's a, a 200 Varus test fee for launching a currency. And because it's non-refundable, as soon as that definition is mined in, then that um half of that fee is paid out to the blockchain on that definition transaction okay now the problem and i'm gonna it's not gonna be like your five for a second because this is important the problem this is solving is that if you leave a five thousand varus test fee on a block every once in a while then Miners will eventually figure out, or miners and stakers, that it's really worth it for them to try and reorganize the blockchain so that they get that block after someone else got it. And that is terrible for blockchain security. Okay? To have that incentive is a completely perverse incentive. And Vitalik actually raised this issue, and it's the reason for the EIP 1559 that effectively changes the fee model so that they're kind of just throwing away, you know, fees and they're saying, well, minor extracted value can't stop that. So miners get to, you know, become almost like, no, gray hats at least on the network. And that's just okay. And this, this protocol says, no, you know, really, um, if the problem is that someone's going to fight to reorg, then why not just, take all the fees and put them into a fee pool that persists block after block and that and then let the miner take a percentage of the fee pool after they put all those fees in okay so the way it works is a miner takes all of the fees from a block and they put them in the fee pool and then they take Right now on testnet, one one hundredth. And so um, what that does is you have enough incentive to put fees in because one one hundredth doesn't cut like better to take more than less. So you have incentive to put fees in, but you don't get all the fees. And if you miss that block, you have zero incentive to try and reorg the chain to go back and get that block because the next one's almost just as good. And the most incentive anyone has at that point is to just mine forward and converge the chain and the economic activity on the chain that generates these fees because it's valuable economic activity supports the security of the chain and doesn't fight with it. So. Did that I know it wasn't like you were five, but did that work? Yeah, so it was an excellent explanation, and I, I, I literally have no holes in the way this system works. I'm pretty sure now that I think that Varus is basically Ethereum 4, but with Monero added on as, as a side grade, and also it's CPU mineable and ASIC resistant. It, it, Thank you. Thank you for saying thing. that, and I appreciate your comment in the spirit it's meant completely. Thank you. From the on behalf of every community member and developer working on it, I'm sure. So, all right, and then oh, and then business. Yeah, 
yeah. Can I like find some exchange listings slash swap listings? And I have lots. Of, I, okay. I have lots of cryptocurrency in general. Sorry for the noisy home. I have a family, right? But yeah, the um... buy more of this coin because the only three exchanges that I can find when I Google various coin plus exchanges, right? I don't really trust. They're listed well, actually, on our website. The, 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 the best exchanges that, you know, I don't want to be opinionated actually on it. Yeah, I'm going to let the community, because there, there are some very trusted exchanges. And I can say, I can say for a fact, I don't want to say, I can say for a fact that I absolutely would trust, um, personally, I would trust Safe Trade. Um, Thumb is the biggest, and I would trust them as much as any big, you know, I, the currency, corporate the currency exchange that I didn't know. Actually, has a has a trade listing. And couldn't and, I just? Uh, I'm, okay. uh, I'm just and also, me. Atomic Dex is decentralized. So, but sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go make a panic buy before, uh, so I can get in early on this. So. Uh, uh, I, you know, we're not uh, we're not trying to like push and make sure that people have panic buys, but wow, I thank you. So I'm at good. some point, people are going to understand what this is. That's my opinion, and it won't be very long, I think. But I do not have any idea what's going to happen to the price. Uh, the price is. Okay. I have ideas, but I won't say them. Listen, you have essentially killed Ada, Polkadot, and literally every other Ethereum. Uh, offshoot in history right you have essentially killed main mainstream ethereum because not only have you kicked asics off the network right and uh kept the network decentralized right outside outside of uh the hands of chinese mining pools but you've also added privacy to an ethereum uh, like blockchain you have essentially no no right? no actually wait 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 it is not ethereum like actually is not and it, it we don't run a vm this is a utxo blockchain and these are smart this is done with smart transactions and i i actually believe what you're saying from the perspective that yeah projects can add vms they could you know and actually the bridge to ethereum so my view is this i don't think that we're going to kill ethereum based on my experience in in you know industry and the I think that no matter what problems Ethereum has, it will be remade somehow at some point to, you know, minor extracted value obviously can be solved much better than what they're doing, obviously, because we do that. Um, you know, the, but the thing is, I, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, yeah, I, I do appreciate everything you're saying, and I fully respect your opinion on that. But when you say kill Ethereum, and it's just I've just seen I've seen large dinosaur-like organizations, and I am not saying Ethereum is that exact. I'm not. Fine. I'm not saying, <laughs> I have seen I have seen large dinosaur-like organizations um, persist much longer than you would ever believe and rise again. So and and so Ethereum you? not being a dinosaur. You can't say that Ethereum is a dinosaur, whatever problems it might have, um, you know, it has a lot of mind share, a lot of resources, and, and it's and it's really got a lot of a lot of mind share right now. And so as people learn about us and and understand what you can actually do, I think they're still gonna be using you know Ethereum for so for years. And, and things will evolve. That's my view. I'm not trying to speak against our project because I actually think we are, I think that this model is the future of decentralized finance because I don't have any other model where it's really a truly decentralized network, unlimited scale of independent blockchains where the natural gravity of mining and staking and everything else actually is spread across the network. So you don't, have a problem you got the 51 percent attack so if somebody concentrated too much mining on something all they're going to do is take more of the rewards and you've got this decentralized notarization model that even lets companies extend it into their 
private networks or businesses or or uh, governments and everything that travels over all of these connected chains can be real funds whether they're private or not it's Alpha, i have a question how did you find paris well you see um i i don't want to sound like a <laughs> cough cough shill but I come from a different community with a coin that also starts with a V, right? Where uh, essentially we always had this idea of basically an ASIC resistant, truly open blockchain solution, right? Where the people secure the network, right? Where everyone is involved in processing transactions, not what we see today with Bitcoin or Litecoin. Or Ethereum, right? Where it's it's centralized in the hands of a few, right? You guys know about the Bitcoin XT fork, right? You know how cryptocurrencies will deliberately suppress their use cases and transaction speeds in order to because they either some of their developers have a stake in a side chain solution or something stupid like that, right? Yeah. Uh, gonna have to <laughs> block stream sorry and uh i, I when i saw varus coin right being especially a fan of monero and uh other asic resistant coins that start with these i instantly was on board essentially it's basically the coin I, that i have about 168 of but better in every way so I'll probably end up selling half <laughs> once the price is a little bit better for me. No joke. And uh, just just to make it clear, uh, Varus is a Komodo fork. So I know it has nothing to do with Ethereum. Uh, I know. I'm just saying that. <clears throat> how do I put it? From an outsider looking in somebody very new to the community. Varus just looks like Ethereum, but objectively better in every single way possible. Well, one thing I, I should probably highlight that's really different and that's important is that if you think about the Ethereum blockchain itself and the native consensus mechanism and everything else, it knows nothing about other currencies. It knows nothing about currencies. It runs an entire financial layer that isn't directly connected to the consensus layer. And in Verus, actually, we will be able to have an unlimited number of currencies through the ID model that will be that people will be able to, you know, connect to and and they can be friendly names and these kinds of, I mean, that's not, I'm not saying Ethereum can't do that, but what I'm saying is that, and when they create, like there will be no need to do something like sushi swap or, you know, these other things, you'll be able to create projects that can have different ways of emitting and you can, you'll be able to change, you know, all sorts of things and above and beyond just all of the options that are generally what most people are using, even on Ethereum, you know, you could go and, Work on a your own project to get quantum secure um, signatures in, and sure, we'd like to have the pull request back, but you could do that your project first. Even you know, it's like it, the model is when we got started, we spent so much time on many things that didn't have anything to do with actually achieving the vision of what we wanted to achieve, and. Everyone in the Varus community who was around the Varus Discord and talking about different things, you know, they were the barrier. They were helping. Everybody was helping. The barrier is this system that requires you to go and, and you know, beg to be listed for $250,000 and, and figure out how to extract all this money from a project that really should be able to grow in some kind of positive environment. And so our model and what we believe is, look, Varus, we're gonna keep 
you know, moving forward and as a community. And the Veris blockchain is a place where people can create their project because it's rent free. And when once they get it started, it's going to be a lot less expensive to get it started. And then they have this connectivity back through the Veris platform, you know, through the multi-chain network that allows them to not have to worry about listing. And all the people who use that system will get a fairer deal, you know, and they don't have to worry about all these different things. And and if the entire network gets too congested and fees start to go up because some blockchain gets too busy, they'll be able to spin off more. So one model, just to keep in mind, is that, you know, it's not at the stage where it's ready yet, but when this gets to mainnet, we are really fine to talk to, uh, you know, other projects that might want to um, put this technology under their project and help us all move it forward too. Between two existing proof of work blockchains work, or at least a proof of proof of power to proof of work solution work. That, so that's not say, that's not as much that's not as much what I was meaning. Oh, uh, um, I know. There are some there are some projects that are actually I don't want to talk about anyone, and I'm not announcing anything. And let me you know, just an idea of maybe considering actually using because there doesn't have to be an NIH thing. If people like what this is, they can just use it. And people have moved, you know, it's a UTXO blockchain with all the privacy, as you mentioned. But if anybody, for example, was moving from a UTXO blockchain to this, um, there are ways to do that. Well, I let's say let's say there's a let's say there's a existing proof of work coin like Litecoin, right? How would a Litecoin to various bridge work? Essentially, no, I'm actually you bridges are fine. We can do bridges, okay? Yeah, um, but I was so in order to do a bridge, you either need to have some multi sig group responsible for the bridge, some network like, um, you know, Ren VM, but I don't think it's open source yet, and so I'd probably wait till it is, um, you know. Or a chain that can do at least some smart transactions at all that would be able to hold funds. But, you know, it's not – it'd be easier to just, like, move all the UTXOs over and keep moving forward and build stuff on this for some projects. But a bridge is definitely doable. I think uh, Zcash is building technology that will allow them to do bridging. But I think that they're trying to rely right now on uh, um, on RenVM at first. So I don't know. But I know that they've got – they added a Merkle Mountain range to their system. And I know that they've got uh, work going on in cross-chain proving and things like that. I, there's a – believe me, we had that two years ago. Um, you know, there's a lot to it. <laughs> But anyways, I, I should stop again. I went on too long. You didn't. I enjoyed most of it, if not all of it. Um, I actually have more questions because I'm a very inquisitive person. Um, one, does this coin have a cap? Uh, is there? Is is it a cap? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like eighty three million some odd uh, uh, coins and. Uh, yeah, as you, the goal was to get to an economy, which I think we're just about there on mainnet, not yet. Uh, after this testnet, it's through all the, you know, community use and everything else. Um, then uh, the goal was to get to an economy, and now we have a blockchain that really, I think, model the entire model doesn't depend on. Uh, rewards although it fully supports them it can be very useful for projects starting up and they can be very useful generally speaking but yeah um uh well don't you think that in a cryptocurrency for the future right let's say people will be using the various protocol 
if 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 the scalability of which you're talking about is true, which I think it is, right? Mm -hmm. Ten, twelve, fifteen years in the future, when people lose large sums of uh, cryptocurrency that was intended for the network, right? What do you think happens when you have dead coins and cannot replenish them eventually? Amount of bears that is acceptable that is uh, accessible for new users will be centralized, right, in the hands of of you know. No, 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 no. See, that's that's the point of the blockchain economy. Right now, on testnet, at least the numbers on testnet are modeled. There, we put in the same block reward. We put in the same pricing we're expecting because we want to see how this like turns out, right? And and what we're getting. Let me just take a look. I just want uh, to like scale emission, okay? <laughs> no, no, I understand, but let me let me. I understand what you're asking. So on get mining info, um, yeah, we just started, so abnormally high number of blocks at the beginning. Average block fees is sixty five Varus tests. Wait a minute. So we're getting the mining reward of the block reward plus all the fees, right? And this that that that's that's fair. Right. Mining profitability in the next Varus update is going to be Well, it's not it's free. not just that. The point actually it's it's more of a kind of dynamic of the math because the point is that as the blockchain continues to go, you know, as the block rewards continue to go down, the economy becomes what dictates the rewards of any particular chain. Its use and its economy. Do you think there'll ever be a time when Let's say it's required for bears to, let's say, add a little zeros on the end to the, uh, or, or, sorry, at at the end of uh, the divisibility. You know how most most coins are only divisible uh, to eight powers, right? So you'll have mm -hmm. eight death digits, right? Didn't you think mm -hmm. that a more advanced chain like bears, which uh, uh, plans to be the proof of hack, proof of work, proof of stake economy of the future, right? Did you think it'll ever come a time where we need smaller amounts of Varus when, let's say, Varus is worth 60k or so, and it is... In, but, 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 here's, but here's... Wait, but here's... I understand what you're saying, but here's the thing. I don't control... Like, I don't have any control over the economy of what people do on the chain. Right? So, the... This is not inflation. These fees are not inflation. This is why you were saying then only the few people actually get the coins, right? So I see yeah. the other question is, how does the chain know which wallets to distribute the fees to? Well, the, the simple mining model is, as I said before, you collect up all the fees for a block, just like you do today. You put them in the fee pool and you take one one hundredth of the ongoing fee pool, okay? So it smooths out the economy. So you don't get... Like we had one block when IDs came out on the main net that was 6,000 Varus. We had one block, you know, more than 6,000. And, and, and the point is that, you know, all of these things are valuable and it makes sense to have an appropriate valuation because that will actually protect the network because it will attract miners and stakers who are actually getting redistributed funds. These are redistributed funds. It's not inflation. Somebody is paying this money. That's then going to the miners and the stakers. And whether they're paying it in, someone needs to mute. I don't know who. Oh yeah. Uh, will fees ever get lower? Like, how do I put that? Let's say Barris is worth, I don't know. I'm the same price of Ethereum and let's say two or three years. Oh, 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 I see. Okay, you're talking about just the fee cost. So, okay, I don't, like, it's going to be our, like, the community's decision over time. Right now, I don't see a reason for lowering IDs because we're going to have PBAS chains and that, and people will actually start PBAS chains to help people get IDs. And if we have everything coming off of the Varus chain when the network really goes fractal, it's just, you know, the trunk will be too large. I mean, maybe everyone wants the trunk too large, but the whole model is kind of designed so that, you know, as the network grows in scale, it grows fractally as well. And all of the 
systems at the roots that stay in healthy branches grow and 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 you know gain liquidity and everything else. So these fees that are coming out are being purchased by in the testnet's case the USD token, the Bitcoin token, you know, these fees are being purchased. Actually, not all of them because some of them are the chain launch fees, but other fees are being purchased because the conversions purchase uh, the native coin of the chain in order to pay the fees with all of the conversion fees in all currencies. It's really an economy. I that's exactly what I was going to point out was you, everything that you see in these fee pools is purchased. So if they're purchased, then maybe the price will rise because the supply or the demand is higher. But then they'll be slowly emitted to the miners and stakers for securing the network. So, you know, so if Varus is like a thousand dollars a coin at some point and we've got 65 coins coming out you know, in a block reward, it just means we're going to have a really high hash and staking rate. But it doesn't mean that there's any inflation in Varus. It means that actually Varus is not being held in just storage and not used. It means that it's being used. So essentially, you are creating a system which in which uh, Varus is being is basically incentivized to be moved around, right? You are also creating well, it powers a all the functions on the chain as normally it should. And you are creating a system in which, again, normal people, even without mining hardware, can uh, secure the network, right? Right. You're also creating a system which can be the, the launching point for modern decentralized finance, right? And uh, basically be another place for tokens and other side chains. Uh, sort of well, they're not side they're not side chains. Remember, they are full fledged, absolutely okay. full fledged independent projects of their own that hopefully we will join with lots of those projects to actually just make the underlying platform stronger and stronger, kind of like the internet, you know. I see. So it's I'm starting to get the, the feeling that Varus coin is no longer just a cryptocurrency. When reality Actually, something bigger than a cryptocurrency. The like like the transition between uh <laughs> bulletin boards to WWW or going I, from I Yeah, I it's nice to hear. You're, that you're seeing that you're underselling your project essentially in the way yeah we are playing. right now but that's because we're starting to you know look look what happens right now we're we're getting this uh test net out and we're making the sausage in public and you know um it's all looking great as you can see it really is there and looking great but you know um every when we're getting a release out Every single thing we change is about a three hour turnaround minimum. And that's whatever, you know, and because we, we put in process because we have IDs. And so we put in a process to sign our binaries with the various coin foundation ID, you know, and that means that you could distribute that binary over IPFS and you could verify that it's correct, you know? And so, um, we are probably, we are not probably, we are underselling ourselves because we're actually not investing because we're not a company or a community, just like you understand. We're um, we're really putting most, at least I'm putting all of my energy and a lot of people are putting most of their energy into making this thing that hasn't existed before. You seem like you're starting to see and I really appreciate it. Um, so making it model. real. What's that? Are you Satoshi? <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> Satoshi. <laughs> I'm exactly like Satoshi. <laughs> it's the entire Thank similar you. mindset, build, and everything. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, 
I would like to think that I have a similar mindset about what he was trying to do. I would like to at least think that. Yeah. And then, uh, so in about three years, you're going to disappear and only come back to say <laughs> Craig White is a writer. Or sorry, Craig White is lying. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get a stitch. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, I probably should drop off and go do some Mother's Day things because, you know, tomorrow. Oh, wait, um, before we do that, um, I can connect to the new quantum gravity chain without a space in it. And so I can. Oh, this should, get, this should get a launch. Yeah. This should get oh, a yeah. launch. Yeah. Is that right? Well, I mean, he won't see the launch because Asher did it, but uh, I can show a cross chain send. And then we won't be able to see it. I mean, well, I, will stay, I will stay on long enough to. Yeah. yeah. Let's All look right. at it. I'll stop right. sharing my boring text screen. Um, my computer crashed right as you just said, thinking about tomorrow, and it kept on repeating thinking about tomorrow. I'm like, no, my computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Wait, can uh, can you see it? My screen? Looking good. Oh, nice. Okay. So, yeah, I'm just going to repeat. I have some, you know, various tests that I mined here. All of this is what I mined in the past uh, hour or so, or a little more. I'm winning a lot of blocks, but that's because of the high. It's also blocks. running fast, and there aren't that many miners, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Actually, I don't know if it's running fast. So then we pick the one here. No spaces. No spaces. <laughs> yeah, we can add it. And we'll fix that. So right now, don't make your chains with spaces, please. Yeah. And I have some because I started mining it uh, to make the blocks advance a little. But um, if I go here. Oh, uh, did Asher forget to give you a pre-allocation? I had very little. I had like 14 at first, so you might that's have a, that's, probably the, that's probably the block, actually. Yeah, so maybe he didn't pre-allocate, but I, I have some, so it's fine. We can show it anyways. Uh, I select Rares Test. It gives you... So, yeah, this is... I remember someone was asking about the time difference. If you're sending on chain, it's going to be around two to ten minutes. If you're sending off chain, um, this is sending to Varus test through this bridge currency, which is on quantum gravity, and it will take around twenty minutes to half an hour to arrive. And there will be more sophisticated tracking methods in the GUI soon. So we just pick. Uh, Ideally, not a change address. Enter as destination, and then we can. Say, oh, Michael, did you did you import your wallet or put the other wallet in and do a scan and a, and a rescan? Uh, no. That's why you do actually have a preallocation. Okay. So once I you show so. this, you will get a bounty of. Quantum gravity coin of a million quantum gravity coins for showing this. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the fee is here, uh, here, and this is the estimated price. This is always going to differ a little bit um, because of the fact that all all the conversions are done at once. So there's no hundred percent accurate way. Uh, check everything and then confirm. And then here we can pending. We can wait for it to get one confirmation. Uh, once this transaction gets confirmed, it will say sent, and that's when it will take around twenty to thirty minutes to arrive on Varus test. But once it says sent, you can be certain it's going to arrive. It's just going to take a while. Um. Right now, this chain, I'm not sure if Asher's mining. I can show off merge mining and also push the blocks forward a little bit so that it says sent. Uh, start with two threads. 
And this time it'll actually update the hash power. So just got to wait a little bit for the GUI to touch the numbers and everything to kind of spin up. Here you can see, uh, yeah, so. You must be running less stuff. You're faster, too. Yeah. Well, I'm also running on two threads. I'm not sure. I think last time I. Oh, I was... right. Right, right. That's, yeah, that's why. But no. um, you can see here, both chains are confirmed as merge mining. So Varus test knows that it's merge mining, and then quantum gravity knows that it's merge mining. And then these numbers are. Uh, actually identical, um, but the way that the GUI fetches them, there's a little bit of a delay in between the way that it fetches one and the way that it fetches the other on the intervals. And so they're always going to be like really close. But in reality, you can know that they're the same number because you're using the same hash power for Ferris test or quantum gravity. And you're essentially uh, multiplying your hash power by two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question or two or four? Yeah. So uh, now that we're doing this, I, I'll stay a little bit longer too. Okay. So basically, yeah. right. I have a lot of questions, like so many questions. So essentially bears can launch blockchains independently, right? Within yeah. seconds, right? Yeah. And miners will be able to merge mine all of these blockchains for our up to 22, world. up to 22 on a single computer up to 22, but there's an unlimited number that can be on the network. Okay, <laughs> so you're, let's say hypothetically, there's multiple different currencies, right? All of these tokens, right, could be, how do I put it? <clears throat> Merge mine. And then could I, because of the nature of the liquidity on the various network, could I instantly end up converting those rewards back to the various? Essentially, sure. not only increasing my reward for mining right but also allowing me to take from the c pool right and, e and increasing my mining rewards too you created the system for miners which is probably well yeah because because for a decentralized system miners and the people around the world who actually run that this is not a centralized internet computer as you know somebody announced yesterday this is this is a decentralized system for the people by the people you know really it's it it sounds like a miner's oh, and one more, and one more thing that you mentioned you called the coins tokens every chain has a coin and an unlimited number of tokens I'm, of its I'm, own i'm 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 mind blown this is <laughs> this is some i feel like everything in this in this system is amazing but I feel like some further optimizations to various hash would, would probably be needed as there's this looming threat of FPGAs on the network. I don't no, we have, have FP, we have FPGAs on the network and they don't uh, really outcompete CPUs by much at all. Mike, what are the, what, what's the hash rate for a standard FPGA compared to a Ryzen 7? We had FPGAs. Like the beat, the... I, the uh, Chris, I think Chris had some good numbers before, but the the numbers I heard for BCU, like a, one of the big BCU FPGAs, was last I heard like somewhere in the seventy something mega hash range, and uh, the fastest uh, Red Rippers are getting I don't know one hundred and twenty five mega hash or something. But you know, FPGAs get uh, they're more expensive, but they have lower uh, power requirements. And so what we tried to do, we tried to tune the algorithm to be about like one, we figured that if somebody's going to spend money on an F and we can tune it, the algorithm is actually tunable. So we figured that if somebody was going to spend money on an FPGA, that they should at least get a little premium. And so we didn't completely nerf FPGAs all the way. We just made it so that, you know, they, um, they're maybe, I don't know, it's probably around a one point. One point, actually, right now on price performance, it depends on the, they might not even be better price performance than a CPU, but they're better. They're definitely better, um, and they might be, but they're better um, for power, you know. 
They take less power. Okay. And not everybody wants an FPGA anyways. So, uh, um, can I can I interject for a second? Uh, sure. Alpha Squadron, do you realize that uh, a lot of people are already mining on their phones, which are basically ARM computers, and they're doing that at about the same about the same uh, um, efficiency, power efficiency as the best uh, CPUs we have. And that is a huge point for decentralization because imagine that everyone in Africa that has a phone can mine virus and generate some extra income uh, while we here in the West think a computer is normal. They never had that. I actually mine with my Google Pixel 4 exclusively. I basically stopped using it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know about this and I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm afraid of mining on my phone because I'm afraid it will overheat and blow up. Well, actually, but, uh, uh, mining people are doing phone, it. So I guess you want to do it on like, a phone you don't need anymore. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, put your phone in front of a fan. It'll be just fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, actually, people are doing it. I'm really mining. surprised that I'm really surprised at the hash rates they're getting, actually. But anyway, like, you, you made an ARM optimized coin. I feel like in the future it'll be dominated by system board manufacturers that just take a bunch of Qualcomm Snapdragons, puts them on an, <laughs> on a board, and then says, no, hey, here's the, your Apex. no, no. The the algorithm is a little bit different than most other algorithms. It's actually got um, code in it in a place where it can really be somewhat tuned. You know. And we kind of have a model that um, allows us to kind of nerf FPGAs right now. We, you know, when we get real actual ASICs made for the algorithm, then we are going to have to figure out if our tuning is going to be able to handle that. It might not be able to get them, you know, equalized because that's a, people like to call them the same thing, but a real, um, ASIC that's not an FPGA is basically like the same real estate of a CPU optimized for one purpose, you know? Well, we do have ASIC so, that's called CPUs. Um, what's that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's And that's exactly what we're doing. We're using the CPU as an ASIC. That's what we're doing. Um, I will I will just say, I think the ARM processors, depending on which one you have, actually get uh, more power efficiency than some x86 CPUs. Well, I, I'm noticing because my ARM CPU, right, my Google Pixel 4 gets about the same hash rate as my i7-2600. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. The power efficiency on that is insane. I mean, I, I am baffled beyond words, and I feel like I'm soon going to have to raid eBay for used phones to create a... Uh, I, will, yeah. I will say... You have to get phones with relatively new processors, and um, the the phones can't be out like a Ryzen Threadripper as of now. Maybe. Oh well, yeah, time. but it's it's much cheaper. <laughs> I I oh, believe yeah. you can get a quad core Snapdragon chip, and the seven nanometer architecture bundled with the phone also <laughs> for like twenty two dollars on eBay. That's an extra five mega hash. If do that times eight, you have a, you basically have about the same hash rate as a Threadripper with a quarter of the price, if not the same price. Actually, I was thinking of making a board that had eight cores um, and was going to mine on it. That the, the technology for CPUs actually outpaced me, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Well, yeah. I feel like if anyone wants to come up with a uh, stupid idea involving a Frankenstein chip full of ARM processors that is inserted into the PCI Express lane for optimal various hash performance, uh, please DM me. We can. Uh, uh, we, if you we, if you know KeyCAD, I will happily hire you. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, except I am poor, and also I do not have uh, any experience in KeyCAD. That's sad. Yes, it, it, it is sad, but 
Uh, have fun becoming the 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 best uh, top uh, Varus manufacturer for FPGAs, arm based FPGAs. <laughs> uh, you, you can cool. actually get um, ar- not really arm cores, but somewhat mostly compatible arm cores for FPGAs. You can download the uh, v- Verilog and VHDL files online somewhere. I, I was thinking, hypothetically, right. Couldn't uh, couldn't literally anyone with a with a processor or sorry phone from the past five or so years be able to participate in mine on the Verus network efficiently? And uh, couldn't anyone buy like a used Xeon? Like, for example, I could get a used uh, twelve core Xeon or a used uh, twenty four core dual socket, so forty eight core Xeon system. Actually, or less than the price of a Threadripper, and have similar various hash performance, if not better. Um, okay, actually, I suggest I, you have a look uh, in uh, in the CPU hash rate channel. There is a hash rate pinned that has uh, the reported hash rates that, that community members reported. Um, but we're straying away from the testnet release, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, I, although I love the discussion. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So, when do you think we'll see this on mainnet? You know, I think I've learned my lesson about estimating. I think that what we've... Let me just tell you where it is. Because uh, where it is right now is it's actually in very good shape. Each of the chains themselves um, are... Like, everything except for... The currency conversions are, I would say, hardened. The currency conversions in cross-chain piece are hardened. The currency um, conversions are actually very simple to harden because in a similar way to the way Ethereum, you know, makes sure that the state arrived at is the same. That's how that works. So basically, you you take what should produce a certain set of outputs and conversions and you run it and if it does then that is accurate it follows the protocol and so um so we're what we're showing right now is a real network i mean showing using what we're using showing now and using you know is it's a real network um i'm gonna confirm that the issue was the space but i'm guessing that that might be what us all caught up in that um thing and and we'll fix that um and you know we expect most everything on it to work right now uh but that doesn't mean that it's ready for mainnet yet it's not um the mainnet piece runs out of the same system but we keep it you know there, there are in the new protocol. There are different code paths that we just need to make sure that we get everything hardened, and that's really kind of so. There, are, okay. There's hardening, and then there are a couple. Let me think about. Um, there's hardening. There's the uh, we'd like to get that import uh, arbitrage transaction in that I told you about because I think that is as close to a solution as you can get to front running in, in a protocol. Um, right now we have as close to a solution as anyone can get that I know of ever. But I think with that, we'll be closer. And uh, um, oh, so I think, let me think. There has been, we've discussed the idea of using, I told you about the extra Merkle, adding a Merkle mountain range into some of the cross chain stuff, but we've, I don't know if we'll do that or not. So um, there is a, there's one feature, actually two features that we don't have in that are very minor. Um, Right now, when you mint a currency, if you have a centralized currency, and if you have a centralized fractional currency, like if you, the only companies I believe should have those and use those are, are existing, you know, financial houses, because I don't know that anyone should naturally trust 
a centralized, uh, but you'll be able to see that that's what it is. And, you know, you won't be confused. Um, but a centralized fractional currency can actually mint price neutral. It's like it can emit, you know, price neutral currency. And, um, and if you burn the default behavior is it's price neutral. We're probably going to have an option of um, mint change weight. But effectively, there's a reason for it. Um, it effectively would devalue that currency for everyone holding it a little bit the same way that burning um, or mint change price, I'm sorry, not change weight. Um, mint change price actually would change the price, make it go a little bit lower. Centralized currency, we're going to make it possible for centralized currency to be able to do that because interestingly, that math creates the dynamics that would allow someone to do proper lending pools. So, um, you know, mint change price um, and then uh, burn change weight. Very minor things, but now on this last round before testnet, we got something in that would make them, that would address the reason we didn't do them to begin with. Aside from that, that's all there is, as far as I know. I mean, it's not, there's not all of the crush to get it working because, you know, we're now fixing little things here and there. And it's really a matter of getting these pieces hardened. If we're going to put any of these other things in, we decide. But we don't hold it for things, and then and then mainnet. I don't know what that means to other people in terms of time, because it's actually really going to just get there when it gets there, and we're all working to get it there, and it's not far. But you know, we've had all of the soon memes and the dancing, ready to pass away memes, and you know all these things, and it's funny. I think I learned my lesson. <laughs> I think the community taught me the lesson about. I'm, yeah, it's been it's been the hardest. Um, I like the, uh, like the uh, ambition you have there, but I like the how humble you are. Just uh, please, please don't disappear in three years like the original Satoshi did. I don't have a plan to. Okay, cool. And also, uh, before you go off to do Mother's Day stuff, right? Yeah. Tell me. In your personal opinion, how long do you think it's how long it's going to be until at least stakers can join stake pool risk free? Oh, you see, you're asking me a question that we are going to enable. It's already something you could do on testnet, and I don't like it because I. It's all a statistical question whether you're mine. The best thing for the network is if everybody solo mines and everybody solo stakes, you know. And yeah, I mean, IDs that can be locked and revoked and recovered, you can imagine ways that you might, you know, put money on an ID and give it to a staking pool, you know, and, uh, and that wouldn't really be much risk um, because you could hold the rev. I just didn't really want to promote that or even like, I didn't want to spend any time to help people do that. Actually. Now it's recorded. Cause you asked me. <laughs> no. Oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's definitely something that can be done, but I really hope that, that people really understand. And the other thing about decentralization is, you know, everybody talks about, well, I can get block rewards more often. If you can merge mine, Large and small projects, like if you start your own project and you can merge mine other projects, it helps to conceivably helps to pay for your project. And if you can merge mine large and small projects that you're interested in and that, you know, they there may be many other chains that other people are interested in. And all of a sudden, you know, there might be other ways to get rewards more often with the occasional jackpot on the bigger chains. You know what I mean?
Okay, I I feel like most of my questions have been asked, but I I still don't fathom how how more profitable mining will be. Do you have a rough estimate of, of of the typical block reward? Not like the the actual like inflationary block reward, but like what the average miner is going like an increase over before, right? And now, assuming current chain usage is the same. That's the thing. It's just going to vary up and down a chain. The other thing I really love about it is that when someone does a chain launch, there's a natural attraction for everybody to find out what's going on. I just uh, I'm going to be really happy in a couple of months where my I realize my Google Pixel Four essentially makes fifty bucks in Bears Coin randomly off a block reward while mining to a pool. Okay. But if it does, then everybody's going to join you and it's going to go to some maybe really good, but still. It, you know, the other, the other really interesting thing it. about there's another really interesting thing about this is that what to mine is not going to consider merge mining and it's not going to consider fees. So it might be a little bit of a secret. I mean, I'm going to be too busy to go tell everybody, but I except for I'm going to want my friends to be mining, too. And and we'll be I'm not going to hold off telling everybody. I'll probably just be busy coding. But you know how it is. When people find the more people find out, then it has the potential to do everything you're saying. And if everybody's mining it in the whole world, then it's going to be at some level. We don't know what. You heard it from the man himself. Everybody, go on to eBay, buy used Android phones, boys. <laughs> used Android phones, guys. This is the future. We are going to create the Veris ASIC. My Linux kernel won't boot. Okay. Uh. Wait, I see. I see. A, uh, no, there is a. There's no 22 chain limit on the network, right? I see a question that's a legal question. First of all, we don't really do legal questions um, because we're not lawyers, and we have a foundation where we do legal questions in attorney-client privilege meetings. We don't really, we really stay away from everyone who's doing a blockchain or a currency project. They need to get their own lawyers and have their own legal questions covered. But I will say something. Um, I don't really, Veris is a network, a mathematical network of software run by people around the world. There's no company who is responsible when you say Veris would be responsible for KYC. That makes no sense. Veris doesn't control IDs. Veris doesn't control the currencies. The currencies are just part of the consensus rules. The conversions are math that people do on their own computers that happen to agree with the math that people do on everyone else's computers. And so I, I'm not, we're not going to have a legal discussion, but I would not like to have speculation of uh, things that especially I don't believe are true, that there would be, I, I will say that as far as I know, everything that we are doing is absolutely correct and decentralized enough. And I, oh, this was a response to, uh, wait, dude, you're saying what right above the, like the questions right above you was someone asking about uh, FATF draft rules on AML and KYC. I don't think that they affect us. I believe that they affect they might affect companies or organizations using um, the platform, but there are going to be so many things you can do on the platform that the real answer to that is everybody has to get legal advice if they're concerned or or feel that they should, you know, might need it. As far as the platforms go, you know, we have a, a legal opinion from one of the best firms saying that we are. Um, you know, how we, a uh, how we compliant system. And, and that doesn't mean that everything everyone does on it will be how we compliant. It just means that Varus, I don't believe that we have any issue. And no, we don't do airdrops. We do not do airdrops. You might want to look and see, um, but, but I was going to, let me explain something because airdrops actually have had opinions related to them. And I don't, I don't want to have a legal discussion. Thank you. Um, but I but I will say that um, 
airdrops are a tool that ICOs or other projects used to, uh, you know, to get interest because they were effectively able to create this launch that created value in the process and then give away these airdrops so they would give people money that they got in the process of the launch. Well, okay, some people on the legal you know, side don't like have some opinions about that. And again, I don't want to talk about it in detail. And, uh, and um, I'm going to try to stop looking at these new questions while I'm answering this one. Um, but when a chain is launched, it, the fees are, I think, pretty exciting to miners, to stakers. And I think that dynamic will net, it's, a, it's something that's required, but it's actually probably good for the project. Because it's no matter what the price of a launch is, the relative price, that is something that will generate interest in the launch. So anyways. <laughs> well, hey, wait, before you go, before you go, right. Okay. Will fees stay the same for the average user? Well, so I mean, the fees, the fees are, there is a form of a fee marketplace. There is. And as long as the blocks are not like, as long as the system is not congested, then they should stay the same. When the system gets really congested, the more busy it gets, the more fees are going to go up, but they're not going to go up by people trying to front run and paying higher fees to do that. And when they do, if they do go up based on things, just getting really busy, the PBAS chains will be able to be an unlimited pressure valve as well. So the fees will, you'll always be able to, you know, send currencies to parts of the network that don't have high fees and use them there. So you're saying, let me put it, can Veris be a, a, a stable payment currency or at least a very usable payment currency with less than 1% or less than 1 cent fee, similar to Litecoin, right? I, I believe that that will be the case for, I don't know exactly if it's going to be forever but if varus becomes too expensive to you because that is actually a pretty high fee if you would make it relative like i don't know what price varus would have to be for an average fee to be that high for normal transactions but the thing is that um if it ever did get to the point where people wouldn't use the varus blockchain except for bigger transactions because it is just too congested that could be a natural outcome of a fractal network growing. You know what I mean? So what you're trying to say is you're not going to be able to manage fees specifically to keep it a, a uh, low fee currency. So when mm, coin is that's not what I'm really saying. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the network should always have low fees, always. And the Varus coin blockchain in the network, I don't know for sure because the busier it gets, if miners are choosing between business that you know can generate a lot higher fees, they're going to have some limits on the high fee um, things to put in the block. That's already been a plan for consensus to allow a flow of normal transactions without a problem. But I don't, uh, I don't think it'll be a problem at all because the network has unlimited scale and it, and you'll be able to send currencies from one chain to another and leave them there, or use them there, okay. or back. Basically, fees, not a problem. When Veris coin is sixty k, fees will be like five cents, right? I don't know, actually. I'd have to go and try to do some calculations. And, and then you'd have to make assumptions about how busy it is. But if Veris coin was 60K, then I would bet that um, the larger number of transactions would be on the chains that are a little bit out from the base and that the smaller number of larger value transactions 
would be more towards the base of the tree of the fractal network. That makes sense. Your coin is too complex for me to shill on biz. I'm sorry. How do I how do I start? Am I supposed to say, okay, guys, uh, this coin, uh, privacy, uh, 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 side chains, uh, it's not side chains. Nothing. You know, the problem about Varus is that nothing you do to describe it. Yeah. There's no word for it yet. This is. There's no word for it. Do you do you even? There is a word. It's called Verus. <laughs> we're gonna. We're, I I feel like I got into a community two years late. I want to be able to mine fifty barracks of block. This is unfair. You might be able to when the this gets to mainnet. Oh well, yeah, but I have ten mega hash. Good luck with that. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, you're right. Hi, I, I just, anyways, guys, I'm gonna need to. I'm gonna need, yeah. wait. Uh, Mike, one sec, one sec. Yeah, uh, I'm also gonna need to go because it's it's getting pretty late here. But uh, I wanted to mention that I've been running this GUI stream the whole time, and uh, some of you may have noticed um, the conversion came in. It has seven confirmations now. There's actually two conversions because I made one before I started live streaming, but the latest conversion for 3.53 Varus test should be. Um, this conversion that I sent on the live stream. And so that was a demo. So, so just, just so that everyone can think about this, I want to say something. So in the time we, you know, it's gone longer and we had the space in the name thing, but in the time we've been talking, we together, you know, if other people are mining it or I don't know, I'm not launched this quantum gravity chain. Michael connected to it by finding it in his drop-down list on the Varus desktop, started mining it, get his pre-allocation, so he could have been someone without one, and actually converted it to a more liquid currency and could have converted it to DAI or dollars or whatever else, whatever other currencies happen to be on the network. Within hours of launching it without an exchange listing. That's pretty good. Yes, that is really, really good. This is a... Uh... Boys? So. Panic buy. Panic buy. Easy. <laughs> easy so thanks everybody i think i'm gonna drop off and and i appreciate it yeah. again everyone's time and um you too. and i'm ahead. glad that we had a chance through it to show all of the pieces that we actually wanted to show even though they didn't come all at the same time and we got to show the little glitch which lets you know that it's real because it's real so you can go all yourself and go mine on quantum the quantum gravity chain without spaces, and you can send between chains yourself, and uh, you can convert and you can do all that stuff. I'm sorry, but I'm too uh, selfish. Know if... Just not mining on mainnet. I got to make that fifty cents <laughs> a day count. Yeah, understood. All right, thanks everybody. Take thanks, care, Mike. everybody. Take care. Thanks, Mike. Bye.